the first stuff you make is always going to be terrible and it's just going to get better. But if you don't make it and ship it, you never have that sort of, you know, lexicon or library of material to look back on and go, wow, I've come pretty far here. Business of Architecture, episode 250. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. You can get a free trial by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. And I definitely thank you for supporting that link. Today, I welcome Eric Reinholdt to the business of architecture. Eric Reinholdt is the owner of 30 by 40 Design Workshop based out of Mount Desert, Maine. His designs focus on simple, modern residential architecture. In addition to being an architect, Eric is one of the top architect content creators on YouTube. You may ask what a content creator is. Practically every single week since 2013, Eric Reinholdt has produced and released a video on YouTube. The topics of his videos range from design critiques to book and product reviews, behind the scenes video blogs of his life in studio. In today's show, Eric reveals what it took to build his YouTube subscriber base to over 100,000 subscribers at the the time of this interview, over 156,000 subscribers, which gives him an income stream outside of traditional architecture and brings him project inquiries from around the world. You'll also discover in today's show how to create engaging video content that gets shared. Eric's going to talk about his thoughts on that. How YouTube helps Eric to grow his business, both his YouTube business as well as his architecture practice, and how he's able to share his design expertise in an engaging way and affect and impact people around the world. Eric truly is a leader when it comes to creating a practice of impact. And so with that, let's jump into today's show. Eric Reinholdt, welcome back to the business of architecture. Hey, Enoch. Glad to be here, man. Good to see you. It's so good to see you, Eric. And tell us what has been your focus lately since you last came on the podcast, which was over a year ago. Oh, it's been a year. All right. Um, Well, I've been doing, um, you know, half my business, and I think I probably talked about this last time, half my business is working with clients. So I still have a bunch of client work, working on a couple of houses right now, a couple of private projects. Um, And the other half is sort of YouTube and building out products. Um, So a lot of content creation for the YouTube channel. My YouTube channel is now Hundred and close to 160,000 subscribers. So that's become its own business, uh, self-contained business there. And um, I'm working on a course now. And so lots of things, uh, lots of things cooking right now. Tell us, how does a YouTube channel become a uh, a business? <laughs> um, well, it's it, so I've been on YouTube since 2013. So we're in 2018 now. So it's been a long slog. And I think anyone who uh, works on YouTube for any sustained period of time will tell you that it's not an overnight thing uh, for sure. So it's a lot of um, sort of thankless hours of content creation and um, really putting in sustained effort over a long period of time. Now, I'm, I made a couple of changes this past year, which, um, you know, in 2017, which really changed the trajectory of the channel, which, you know, we can talk about. Um, but there was a lot of slow growth and, um, you know, a lot of a long time where I was just making things and it was going uh, to just out into the ether and I wasn't getting a lot of feedback. Um, but what I was doing with each sort of piece that I uploaded was planting these little seeds um, for making, uh, for earning revenue. So the first way um, that you earn revenue on YouTube is probably the one that most people are familiar with, which is, you know, advertising revenue. So uh, to earn anything of consequence from advertising revenue, you have to have a lot of views. That's the problem with that, you know. Um, So you have to keep making videos and each one of those videos then contributes and accretes to create, you know, some modicum of income. And if you get to the level where I'm at, it it can be pretty significant. Um, But when you're just starting out, it's really just pennies. Um, And actually, YouTube's changed its advertising uh, program so that even when you're just starting out, you can't monetize your videos that way. So that's that's not even an option for a lot of people. 
but the other way that I um, earn revenue there is through affiliate links. So if I'm reviewing like this week on the channel, I reviewed a book and I put an Amazon affiliate link in the, in the description and people click on that link and the things that they buy, obviously I get some commission based on that. Um, another way is uh, I use videos for lead gen. So obviously if I'm doing videos about custom residential architecture and materials and things like that, I'm getting new clients from that because they're seeing me as a thought leader in the space and um, they're saying, hey, let's work. So that's, that's another means. Um, there's also digital products that I have. So, you know, I'm offering up packaged um, pieces of my practice that I sell to people. So that's another way that I can earn income. And then when you get to a certain level, advertisers come to you, brands come to you. You know, I'm speaking with a variety of home brands right now about doing videos to uh, speak about their products. And so that has a certain, you know, income associated with it. There's lots of different ways um, to do this. It's just the way that I've done it. You can certainly turn it into speaking opportunities. And, you know, there's a whole, a whole realm that I'm not even at at this point. But, um, you know, it's it's been an interesting experiment for me, for sure. And what have been your biggest insights? You said that the YouTube channel turned uh, kind of turned a corner. What have been your biggest insights about having success on YouTube? Yeah, so YouTube, um, I think for a long time, when I was first making videos, 2013 to say 17, so long time there, um, you know, I was just sort of dabbling in it. And what I was doing was I was taking uh, pieces that I had written for House, for example, or pieces that I'd written for my own blog, and I was essentially reading them and converting them into videos. So I'd read a post and then I'd put some images with that post. And it I think those things fell really flat because it didn't speak to the medium of video. So video is all about, you know, moving pictures and telling stories. And, you know, when I got through all of the, that content and I had no other pieces to sort of upload into and in, turn into video form in that sort of like a slideshow, almost like a slide share content. Um, I decided, you know, I really have to do start doing something different here. The channel was just sort of flatlining. It wasn't really growing. So in 2017, I said, you know, if I'm going to stay here and really make something of this, I want this to be representative of who I am and, you know, my own creativity and my personal brand. And so I really started doubling down and looking at other people on YouTube who were telling great stories. You know, the people who were really exploding, people like, you know, Casey Neistat. I'm sure you're familiar with Casey Neistat. He's a vlogger. Um, Peter McKinnon, a whole bunch of other people, right? And, and what these people were doing was telling stories. So that's exactly what I tried to emulate, that behavior. So opening a video with a sort of teaser, like, you know, doing more showing rather than telling. And that's perfect for video, right? I mean, you have this visual medium. Um, I can show people what the inside of my practice looks like. I don't have to describe every single nuanced detail of what I'm doing. I just show it. You know, I show that I'm sketching on something and people get it. And, and what happened was, you know, the subscriber uh, base just started to explode. I ended up working with a filmmaker that year to produce a short film, which I entered into a, 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 the Architecture and Design Film Festival. It was accepted there. Um, and that taught me about storytelling. I worked with a story editor, you know, and all these little lessons sort of accumulated into this body of knowledge that said, you know, this is how you tell stories on YouTube. This is how you make YouTube videos, you know, really make... Um, it's really about visual storytelling. And so once I made that change, it, it's just been an incredible um, turnaround for the channel. So now I'm adding about, you know, 16 to 18,000 subs every month. And it's just, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't make that in the first three years. <laughs> I probably didn't have 16,000 subs in the first three years of the channel. So to see that kind of growth is just, it's, it's very cool. It's rewarding. And when you talk about stories, what are you seeing as the most, I guess the content that gets the most shares or the most interaction? What are you learning about the actual content side of things for your particular content that you're sharing? It is um, the single, so a couple of weeks ago, I published a vlog. People have been asking me for to do a vlog style, which would be in the vein of Casey Neistat or Peter McKinnon or Matty Hapuya, some, someone like that, where it's just um, real authentic, like day in the life kind of content. Like, what does it look like to be an architect? And so, um, you know, I resisted that for a while because I thought, well, who's going to be interested in in this. Like, you know, a lot of what we do every day is it's repetitive. Sometimes it's boring. And, 
you know, I struggle with this idea of sort of painting this ideal life. And I just said, you know, I'm just going to show what a typical day might look like. I'm going to walk through, you know, it, it happened to be a snow day. My kids were home, you know, I was shoveling and there's, I mean, I think you might've seen this one, Enoch, but, um, I just walked through the paces. Like, here's what my routine is. Here's what I would typically do. Here's how I structure it. And it, th that kind of, um, you know, I, I had a design problem, I think, that I was working on that day. I was designing a set of elevations and I just sat the camera down on the table and I talked about what I was doing just in a real genuine way. Like it wasn't scripted. Like I've, I've done plenty of scripted videos in the past, but this one wasn't scripted in any way. It was just like, I'm just going to talk to the camera and talk about how I'm feeling. And the biggest reaction that I got from it was people saying, wow, I just, you know, it, this is a real window into your thought process and, you know, how it really feels to be in the studio. And I think people really like being drawn into someone's personal experience, whatever that, whatever that might be, you know, there, of course, there's going to be mundane things about your day. You know, everyone has to brush their teeth. Everyone makes a cup of coffee, but it's kind of cool to see how you Enoch Sears might do it in your house versus, you know, how I do it in my house or, you know, we're all architects. We're all designing elevations all the time, but I do it, you know, in a much different way than you do it probably. And so it's kind of cool to see that. And I learned a lot, probably more than any other video that I've made in the past year from making that video because the feedback was amazing. And, and one of the other cool things about YouTube is, you know, they'll tell you pretty quickly, like what, not only in the comments, what people like, but also the YouTube algorithm. Like if people are clicking on your video and watching it, that video is going to get promoted and promoted and promoted and you'll see it just take right off. And so it's a great sort of learning lab for content generation. Like you can see quickly the topics and you can even like, it's granular enough where you can look in the video and see like, okay, this is what I was talking about here. And then all of a sudden, you know, the audience just drops off. So you can learn a lot actually just by doing these little sort of experiments. So you're referring to the fact that YouTube will actually show you where in the video people fall off. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. So, you know, if you're talking, so I'm giving an example of, you know, designing the elevation and then the next scene is, you know, me going out for my midday hike, right? Well, you can see, blam, people, they're not interested in that. So it tells you about the audience, right? It tells you your audience is really engaged for all the architecture bits. And then, you know, some, and I'm not saying that, that that's what happened with that video, but you can pretty clearly tell, like even like using certain words, like saying mod, the word module, you know, I follow this guy who does YouTube coaching and he's like, yeah, I had a client who he, every time he would say module in the video, people would just drop off. And so there's certain cues that you can really pick up on if you dig into the analytics, I'm not saying that you have to do that. You know, I really treat this as a creative pursuit. And so I don't get all that granular, but I can see, you know, the, the bigger picture of it is when you start telling authentic stories about the way you live and practice, people just, they love it. And there's very little of that content out there in the world right now. And so, you know, I guess I'm lucky because it's kind of this blue ocean strategy. I don't have a lot of competition. Um, people looking for architecture vlogs, they don't have many places to go. So um, same would be true for, you know, making content for owners, you know, people looking to design clients, potential clients, like it's, it's wide open, you know, tell your story and use that, um, to authentically connect with your audience, with your market. I think it's, it's an interesting opportunity. I'm looking here at your YouTube channel, uh, Eric, and that particular one has right now 124,000 views to give our listeners some comparison. Uh, ones on either side of that that were done around the same time are about uh, 17,000, uh, 40,000, 30,000. So nothing to sneeze at for sure. For those of you that don't know the numbers here, I mean, Eric has really accomplished something quite incredible here and he's, he's going great places in the future, I'm sure. Um, but that one video was three times kind of the, the other fantastic videos that you have on here. Yes. Yeah. No, it's, it's clearly something people want more of people ask in the comments to do more of that. And, you know, unfortunately to make that stuff to the level that I want to make it and make it cinematic and interesting and useful, it takes a lot of time, you know? And so it really is a question about like, okay, so how much time do I dedicate to this? You know, what is it giving me back? And, you know, YouTube's a long game and all of this is a long game. And so I'm interested in, you know, making high quality things. And, you know, one of my sort of mantras for 2018 was less but better, which is the old Dieter Rams quote. Um, 
you know, the famous industrial designer. I don't know if you know him, but less but better. Like, so that's where I'm at <laughs> right now. Um, and it's a struggle because, you know, making that video was a, that was a big effort. That was not just one day's worth of work. You know, that was me getting up at 4 a.m. and working on it for yeah, a couple of days for sure. And not to mention all the filming and all the other stuff that went into it. But I've tried to treat that content generation as also a means for getting my work done. So it's helped me sort of institute some discipline. I know I'm going to ship that video every Thursday at 2 p.m. Um, and But at the same time, I know I need to get those elevations designed. I know I need to tweak that floor plan. I know I need, I have a client meeting coming up. So it's all this sort of puzzle of, you know, being intentional and being disciplined to fit it all together. Let's focus on the level that you take your videos to. So uh, for those of you who are listening, there's a great book that came out years ago, The Lean Startup. And one of the concepts they talked about in there was, of course, just shipping shipping the product, which means don't you, – us as architects, we can get so caught up in making things perfect. And in our, in our marketing uh, coaching program, consulting program, Eric, this is something we see a lot is that we want our architects just to get content out there. But they, they never get it out there because they spend all the time tweaking it and making it perfect. So what are your thoughts on, obviously you've chosen uh, um, to spend a lot of time doing your videos, but talk me through a little bit more your thoughts on kind of the rough and ready, just get it out there versus the highly polished production. Well, um, I mean, have you seen a couple of my videos at least? Many. Yep. Okay. So how would you rate the quality of my videos? Do you think they're completely polished or do you think they're a little rough and ready or somewhere in between? I would personally say they're, they're very polished, Eric. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I spend time polishing these things. There's no question. Um, but I'm not a filmmaker um, and I would look at who are far beyond me ability making films and say, whoa, that's a little rough. And I've, I've had people comment on that. Um, and those are the hardest comments to hear because obviously your aspirations for quality are up here, right? I'm watching, you know, Werner Herzog's documentaries and thinking that's where I want to be. And I think all architects struggle with that. Um, the way I've come to terms with it is to dedicate a set period of time every week like and a deadline. So I know that these videos are going to be shipped at 2 p.m. every Thursday, and that is immutable as far as I'm concerned. Like It just happens. And I've done that pretty religiously since 2013. It's been more difficult or less difficult at certain times, depending on the level of work in the studio. But I've made it a part of my ritual and routine to because I know content generation is how my business grows. And so I've really made that um, a habit of mine and a discipline of mine. Um, but I, I have to admit, I really do struggle with polishing things and making them better. Like, you know, the video I just released yesterday that it could have been better. Like I, there was things that were wrong with it. Um, and I just decided it was good enough. And, you know, I mean, Seth Godin has this kind of good enough thing. Um, if you don't ship it, if it never sees the light of day, then it's, you get a zero response. There are zero views on that. And so, you know, could I have gotten more views if I made it a little more polished potentially? But I think, you know, that last 5% takes so much effort to get there. Um, and it's so it's a personal decision on some level. You know, um, you have to be comfortable with what you're putting out there. I think I started off with really basic videos. And I think if people are interested in looking back at the history of my YouTube channel, they'll see I did a lot of just shipping stuff. And, you know, stuff that I look back on now and go, ooh, you know, that's, that's pretty rough. Like, I, you know, I'm certainly not comfortable producing that now. And in the same way, I'm sure in another year or two, I'll look back at the stuff I'm making today and go, oh, wow. Eesh. You know, and so I th it, in, in some ways, it's like looking at an old portfolio, right? If you go back and look at your student work, you see all the flaws in the thing, but you still put it together. It's still an endpoint um, of the project and where your mindset was and your current capabilities at that moment in time. And that's kind of how I look at content creation. Like, this is a result of, you know, my skills and capabilities and my brand and my thought process right now. And it's going to get better. Um, but if I don't put it out there, I, I'm someone, I, I mean, I think this is, it's maybe a personal thing, but you know, like in the personality range, um, you know, if you take a sort of personality chest, I'm an achiever. So in order to feel like I've done something in the day and been successful, like I need to achieve something. And so I, 
I know that about myself. So other people are connectors. Other people need to, you know, be managing big groups of people. And that's what is defining success for them. But I'm an achiever. And so that means I make things. And so making things every single day is just part of my DNA. It's part of how I get things done. It's how I am happy in the world. And so that's an easy way to, maybe it's an excuse or a crutch, but that's how I get content done. Because if I don't do it, I'm like a really miserable person. Um, and I think architects are like that. Just they, they're they happiest making things. So I, I don't think that should be uh, the challenge or the struggle that I think most people um, make it out to be. The first stuff you make is always going to be terrible and it's just going to get better. But if you don't make it and ship it, you never have that sort of you know, lexicon or library of material to look back on and go, wow, I've come pretty far here. Um, you have to build skills by shipping stuff every single week. That, that's, that's how I feel about it. Eric, in terms of the content that you've produced and just looking at the stats of the videos, people dropping off during the middle or people really responding well to something, do you have an example that you can think of? We talked a little bit of a bigger picture. We talked about how the vlogging format was something that got a lot of response. In a more micro instance, is there anything that comes to mind, Eric, is that you've learned through this process about what people respond to, about what they don't respond to? Um. You know, I think w one thing, you know, I don't have any specifics here, Enoch, because like I said, I, you know, I should be better about digging into these analytics, but I feel like uh, it's almost like reading the comments sometimes, like that can affect the art <laughs> in a way. And a lot of this for me is making the art because, you know, if it's all about making the money, then I think the art suffers. And um, so I, unfortunately, I don't have like a super specific example on that. But what, what I can say is, um, when I've made the promise on the title of the video and the thumbnail of the video um, and I don't deliver on that promise, it, the video just tanks hard. And it was a video I made on color um, not long. Well, let's see. It's probably a year ago. Um, and I, th I just did it as kind of a visual essay. Like I thought it would be this kind of creative um, sort of hiatus that, that I was taking from the channel. So I had done a lot of like in, informative, instructive, like highly detailed content. And then I put out this video, which was just like a sort of fluff essay on color, I guess. And people like within minutes of me uploading it were like garbage, bad, terrible, you know, and th like those things are hard to, they're hard to read. And, you know, I had a certain view of what my skills were and how I thought I was narrating a story and it just didn't resonate with the audience and they told me. Um, so yeah, I guess that, that would be the best example. Okay. Interesting. I'm wondering what video, I think I actually watched that video and actually liked it. So that's interesting. Do you find okay. there's a difference between trained architects that consume your content versus the general population? Um, it's so hard for me to know who is a trained architect and who isn't. I have a lot of students watching it. I have a lot of other architects watching it. And then, you know, a lot of sort of clients who are interested in certain topics, you know, people who are just kind of architecture fans. But um, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to know. I think if you put out a certain type of video and you, and you have a string of videos that are very detailed and very prescriptive, like, you know, if you're doing big doors, this is what you do. There's 10 things to think about. And then you do one that's kind of like, it's a little more narrative and a little more loose than people. I think if you've gained an audience based on that certain type of viewership that's expecting detail and you don't give them detail, then you know there it's not going to resonate very well. And when I think when I released that video, you know I probably had a much smaller subscriber base. Now I have a, a big enough audience where you know the the approach that I take with content creation is like. I can only hit like 10% of my audience, like what they want to watch. Basically, if you get 10% of your subscriber base to view your videos in the first couple of days, you're in a really good place in, in the eyes of YouTube. And so that's kind of what I shoot for. It's like, not everybody's going to be into reading architecture books. And I get that, but I hope that at least 10% of my audience cares enough about architecture books that they'll take the time to watch the video. Um, and, you know, the vlog, it turns out like that's, a, that's about a lot of different things. It's about, you know, productivity and personal schedule and it's about design and it's about, you know, looking in someone's house and sort of peeking behind the scenes. And so that ticks like, you know, maybe 30% or 40% of your subscriber base. So those topics tend to be broader, but if I can hit 10, that's kind of, that's a pretty good sweet spot for me. Awesome. Hey, are you familiar with Jeff Durkin? You ever heard of him? 
Uh, no, okay. no, I'm not. So no. he's a, he's a filmmaker. Yeah. He he has a small filmmaking company, Bread Truck Films. Oh, okay. And hmm. uh, the reason why I bring him up, I just had him on the podcast recently. But have you seen any of the trailers for Jonathan Siegel's projects? Architectural. I no. Okay, you should no, check them out. Um, very visual, very fun. The so Jeff and I, he's a he's a trained as an architect. Uh, went mm-hmm. into filmmaking full time, and he's found this niche of working specifically with architecture firms, architects, visual people, and doing these little mini documentaries. And oh, I, cool. you would love his work because it's absolutely fantastic, very beautiful from an architectural sense. Um, but him and I, last time, this was a recent podcast, actually released just recently, where he, we were talking about the future of video in architecture, right? Mm-hmm. Both in terms of conveying spaces in bringing to light good design. And so I'm just curious, since you've been involved in this since 2013, which is, did you say 2013? Yeah, 2013. Yeah, so mm-hmm. you're like the grandfather of architectural video, <laughs> YouTube videos. I guess. But, <laughs> I mean, that, that's a long time in uh, technology today. But what are your thoughts in general in terms of where video is going in the future? I mean, I would, I'm always amazed that architects haven't embraced it more because, you know, there, there's this huge business of architectural photography, right? We all work with architectural photographers to document our work. But the real, the true experience of architecture is, you know, in three-dimensional space, you know, parallax of what, moving through a space. Like, it changes your perception of it completely. Um, you know, the artifice of uh, architectural photography, I completely appreciate you know, how things are photoshopped and tweaked and fine tuned, but there is, it's a real difference to move through a space and experience in a space um, as, com- as compared with, you know, looking at photographs of that space. And so I think the future for video, I mean, we are just scratching the surface of what this can be. And it's, it's, it's evidenced by the fact that I've been doing this five years and there's very few people in this space still. Um, even though, you know, we have cell phones in our pocket, which can record video, you know, Instagram, like they're prioritizing video. Facebook is prioritizing video. Like the immersive experience of VR is like, that's all video, right? I mean, yet we're, we're falling back on blogs and, you know, um, photographs and two dimensional representations of three dimensional space. So I think it's really exciting. And I, I also, you know, you mentioned your friend here that's making films. Like, I think there's a huge opportunity there for architects to tell their story, the story of their work and their buildings through video. And, and I don't think it has to be highly polished necessarily. Um, you know, there's a, there's a YouTuber, Kirsten Dirksen, I think her name is, and she sort of go, it's more sort of sustainability issues and, you know, small home living, but, you know, she's done some wonderful architectural documentaries, just visiting like really iconic works of architecture. And they're just beautiful. I mean, look at Netflix, like Netflix, their abstract series is, you know, there's a couple episodes on architects and interior designers. There's this sort of, um, British show that's come out, um, Extreme Homes, I think it's called, something like that, um, where they're going to visit these different properties. Like, there, there's a huge interest in architecture, and it's a great way to connect with the public at large. And um, the opportunity is just, I think it's massive. So I'm really excited. I mean, I'm excited to look up your friend here when we get off this I'll conversation. Send you, I'll send you the link. Uh, Eric, what would you say to content creators or architects who are listening, maybe young designers or even designers who are very well established? who want to see the opportunity and they just want to get started with video, what would you, what would be your advice? Uh, you know, my advice with everyone, I think a lot of people use the um, gear as a, as an impediment to not starting like, Oh, my video is not going to look that good. Cause I can't afford a $2,000 DSLR, but you know, the quality that you can get out of your cell phone. That's how I started making videos was I picked up my cell phone and I pointed it at myself. That is so acceptable right now. And even, you know, the quality on YouTube, they come down, they downsample and compress your, your work. So it's, it's all going to look very similar. I think, you know, someone who wants to create right now needs to just start creating. And, you know, I, have been telling people that they need to start creating like on Instagram like that. I feel like architects portfolios and you know, people who I'm going to interview to work with me, like I'm going to their Instagram first or their website. So like those use those mediums that are already in place and they're giving you all the tools you need. Like Instagram stories is huge. It's really undervalued attention right now. Um, and it's very informal. So you don't have to spend, 
you know, four hours editing a video to put up on Instagram stories because it's going to go away in 24 hours. But it's a great way to get exposure. It's a great way to test some ideas um, about how to edit edit things, how to put together a story, how to tell a story visually. Um, so I would say take your cell phone, take the stuff that you have at your hand readily available and start creating things. I mean, it's like making architecture, right? Like all you need is a sketchbook and a pen and you can make architecture. And Franklin Wright made architecture without any of the tools <laughs> that we had today, right? Because he just picked up what he had in, uh, available to him and he made things. And I I suggest that to everybody, you know, just pick up what you have access to and start making things. Awesome, Eric. Thanks for being on with us today. <laughs> Glad to be here. Thanks, Enoch. And that is a wrap. To discover more about the process for creating a better firm with less fires and more fun, I've prepared a special webinar that you can watch at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. In addition, I've also prepared a special free training if you're wondering how you can win better projects, how you can increase your marketing to be able to attract and win the kind of projects you'd like, whether you're a sole practicing residential architect or a large firm that does business to business work like institutional, commercial, retail, healthcare work, you can find out more about that free training and register for that by going to architectwebinar.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. I'm a huge fan of using technology in the best way we can to leverage your time and to help create that impact so that you can focus on being an architect and not running a business. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host. And I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world.